for long. So to begin with, um, my name is Curtis Atkinson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, my degree is in anthropology, and specifically I'm interested in why people do the crazy things that we do. Um, and my main area of interest is cooperation. So why we help uh, random strangers, why we uh, spend a bunch of our time developing really advanced open source software and giving it away for free. Um, as a part of that, I am <laughs> on a NSF funded grant with a team from uh, the University of California, Davis and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And we're a really broad multidisciplinary team. So I'm an anthropologist. We have a nonprofit scholar who studies volunteer organizations. We have someone who studies um, public goods and common pool resources. Um, and that's at the University of Massachusetts. And then at, the, at Davis, we have um, big data people and computer or software engineers, empirical software engineers, who are a part of the project as well. So we're able to bring together a diverse array of skill sets to study everything from the governance uh, of projects to um, how, why people choose to engage in the way that they do, all the way up to how the volunteer organization itself is run. And we're able to do that by uh, accumulating all this data, putting it together, cutting it in different ways and looking at it um, because all of that data is available through ASF, because the email lists are public information, because the commit history is public information. We're able to get a really in-depth examination into how these open source software projects work and what helps an open source software project go from an idea, sort of nascent, maybe out in the wild, into a successful, sustainable open source project that will persist for a long time. In addition to the data that we have, we're also gathering um, other form, in addition to the data that's just generally available because projects are a part of ASF, we're also gathering additional information. So we've done some interviews with mentors, 16 different mentors, and we're currently analyzing those interviews now and uh, should have some results in October or November about that interview. And then subsequent to that, we're hoping to do surveys and things with members and participants in ASF to find what really uh, drive successful uh, and sustainable long-term projects. So this study that I'm going to be presenting to you today uses data that's publicly available through the ASF, um, not any of the more in-depth things that we've been doing um, and will continue doing, but data that we were able to scrape off of the website. Uh, as one of the mentors I approached about interviewing told me, uh, there's a treasure trove of data on the internet already. I don't understand why you need to ask me questions. You should just be able to find out everything you need to find out by looking at what I've actually done. And this is actually uh, one uh, effort to be able to learn as much as we can using the data and the data traces that are available already. So before I talk to you about the data, um, I want to give you just a brief introduction to how we on the academic side think about open source software and the production of open source software. Um, so open source software, as you know, because you all participate in it, is software that's produced under a license that allows for free use and typically even allows for it to be incorporated into commercial software from which people can make a profit. Now, licenses are different, but the Apache license, uh, which underlies Apache projects, is uh, broadly classified as a permissive license, allowing individuals to incorporate the source code into profit-making enterprises without requiring them to be um, donated back to the community necessarily. The software itself is hosted somewhere online, and once it is there, anyone can use it. 
So that means it's what we call non-excludable. So once I put it on the internet and make it available, anyone can dip into it, take a copy of it, download it, use it for whatever they want to use it. I can't prevent them from doing that. And software is nice in that one person using the software doesn't prevent anyone else from using it. And this makes it non-rivalrous. So we don't have to fight over who can use the software. We both can use it at the same time. And as such, this makes open source software a pretty classic, what we would call a public good. So um, public goods require the contribution of individuals in order to maintain the goods. And the development of open source software in particular requires the contribution of time and expertise of software developers, principal architects, principal scientists, um, all of these people who in their private lives and in their um, employment are really highly compensated individuals. And they're giving this uh, away to the open source software project, their time and effort. And then um, that gets integrated into this public good. And this sets up a pretty classic collective action problem. So how and why do individuals contribute private goods to produce public goods? And in this case, um, we're even adding a second layer to the collective action problem by introducing software foundations. So these foundations like ASF and many others, uh, they Many of them come from early successful open source projects. You all know this, the Apache web server, for instance. And they offer a broad variety of services to open source pro software projects, including often um, infrastructure and legal support, both things that are really key offerings from Apache, for example, um, in addition to other foundations, open source software foundations. But this support, um, often comes with, it has some costs associated with it. Uh, it, it. It comes with a price. And this can be referred to by open source uh, software developers as a foundation tax. Um, so typically this involves some investment of time by these developers into the provisioning of the services of the foundation. So that could be by participating in a mentorship program or um, being a part of a committee that advises regarding legal affairs or whatever it may be. So these foundations essentially um, add a second layer into the collective action problem. So they take it from just being individuals needing to contribute to a public good in order to maintain it or grow the source of it to um, these organizations organizing the effort and the investments of those individuals. And in order for the foundations to be an efficient second layer, that is not to be a drain on the creation of public goods, they need to be either resulting in the creation of more open source software or higher quality open source software or uh, more sustainable open source software, um, something like that. So the, the effort that they're asking from the developers in contributing to the foundation needs to be offset by um, an increase in some way of the production of the public good. And to do this, many foundations have established what they call incubators. And Apache has an incubator that aims to bring projects. Some are newly created. They're legitimately nascent uh, open source projects with a small community looking to grow. And some of them are code, legacy code being donated by corporations. And they try to bring these projects to long-term sustainability by helping them develop uh, communities of users of the product and contributors to the project. And one of the key ways that they do this is by having experienced open source developers mentor incubator projects. So mentoring has been a topic of study in the social science literature more broadly. Uh, in this literature, 
they define mentoring typically as a personal relationship between the mentor and the mentee. But in the open source software foundation case, uh, it's a little different in that the mentorship is of a project. So the literature also typically looks at the effect of having a mentor compared to not having a mentor. So does a mentee have a better outcome because they had a mentor? But in these incubator programs, one of their cornerstones is typically mentorship. So there's no variation in if someone had a mentor or not. And additionally, in the literature, they mostly look at um, self-report of the quality of the relationship or the impact of the mentor relationship by the mentee. And all of this put together means that the literature seldom focuses on mentors and if certain mentors are more effective relative to others. The data that we have available from ASF, however, allows us to assess if there is individual variation in association with in graduation rate of projects that different people have mentored. So the data that we're using is um, from 286 projects from the ASF that have either graduated or retired. And this represents all of the incubator projects except for the currently incubating projects in ASF. Um, of those projects, 77% of them have graduated. So ASF does a really good job of enrolling projects that it then subsequently moves to graduation. And this leads to a really high baseline expected graduation rate, which makes um, leads to some complications in data analysis, actually. So before we get into the analysis, the statistical analysis, looking at the effect of mentorship on graduation rate, I just want to explore the data a little bit. So here we see the number of individual mentors who have mentored a given number of projects. So there are 128 individuals who have mentored only once and 175 individuals have mentored more than once. Of those, 68 have mentored five or more projects, and there's one individual who has even mentored 28. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I believe that might be Craig Russell or, or, or one, of, one of these long tenured ASF members. So in this figure, we can see the distribution of the graduation rate um, by the number of mentors who had that graduation rate. So there are two types of bars here. One is a black bar and one is a white bar. So the white bars denote individuals who have only mentored one project. So that means they could only have one outcome, either all of their projects graduated or none of their projects graduated. And as you can see here, for most individuals who mentored only one project, most of their projects graduated. And that makes sense because most projects graduate from the ASF incubator. We then see that there's another little bump at 0.5. And this is because individuals who mentor two projects, uh, a fair few of them actually, uh, somewhere around 32, I think, um, half of their projects graduated and half of their projects retired. And then we see a distribution uh, that ranges mostly from 0.5 to 1. And this, again, reflects the um, high graduation rate from the incubator in general. In this figure, uh, we can see the graduation rate um, the, district, the average graduation rate for mentors who have mentored a given number of projects. So for all mentors who have mentored only one project, uh, we have this dot over here, and the bars give the standard error of the graduation rate. The size of the dot denotes the number of mentors who have mentored that many projects. 
So you can see um, this dot at one project is the largest because there are 120 something individuals who have mentored only one project and they get smaller from then. So this uh, figure actually has a few trends inside of it that are interesting to note. Uh, the main trend that's easiest to see if you just sort of like squint your eyes a little bit um, is that broadly speaking, as a mentor has mentored more projects, the probability their graduation rate has gone up. So mentors who mentor more projects graduate a higher proportion of their projects. But that simplified trend line um, really hides what I think is an important trend nestled within it. And this is the, the graduation rate, the average graduation rate for mentors who have mentored three through six or eight projects. And what we can see across that range is that there's actually a decrease in the uh, graduation rate, the average graduation rate of mentors who have uh, mentored that many projects. And you all would be much better at speculating why you think this is the case, much better than I would be. Uh, and I would love to hear whatever ideas that you might have. But my initial thought from seeing this trend line was that as individuals get or as individuals mentor more projects, they get seen as the senior mentor in the mentorship team. Um, but that them being the senior mentor and having additional responsibility that might come with having mentored the most projects of their mentorship team might come a little early. So an individual who has mentored three or who has mentored, I don't know, five projects, maybe is seen as the senior mentor uh, on that project, but might not actually have the experience and the knowledge so far uh, in, in the projects they've mentored to really pick that project up and move it uh, closer towards graduation. And so I think this might highlight uh, uh, this part of this trend line might be something that the incubator could incorporate into its uh, when it's establishing mentorship teams for projects. They might try to, they might, you all, Justin's here, Dave's here, um, you all might might think about uh, trying to make sure that every mentorship team has a mentor that has mentored up in this higher range of the number of projects, uh, maybe even if they're just in an advisory role. But as I said, you all would um, you all would have a lot better sense of it than I would. And then finally, for the data exploration, uh, what we have here is the graduation rate of projects with a certain number of mentors. So um, when a project has one mentor, it has a graduation rate of around 0.6. When a project has two mentors, it has, or sorry, uh, 0.75. When a project has two mentors, it has a graduation rate of around 0.5. And then as the number of mentors gets above three, three to six, it stabilizes at around that 0.8 um, range. And that makes sense because once again, the size of the dot denotes the number of projects. Most projects here have, or most of the projects that have been in the ASF incubator have had three to six mentors, we can see that pretty clearly. But even across this range from three to six mentors, there's a positive relationship between the number of mentors you have and the um, graduation rate of the project. So Dave um, says it would be nice to see how this changes with time. It's very obvious that this will change with time because as, as um, long tenured members of the audience would know, 
most of these projects with only one mentor and only two mentors are early in the incubator's history. Um, if for a long time, it's been the, the norm, if not an explicit policy, to have around three to five mentors in the project. And then, of course, up here, we have this, um, this big jump where once you have seven or more mentors, every project with seven or more mentors has graduated. Um, so we can speculate a lot of reasons why that might be the case. Um, my current favorite <laughs> is that um, really cool, sexy projects attract a lot of mentors and cool, sexy projects probably have a rather high graduation rate to begin with or probability of graduation to begin with. Um, but these ideas about tenureship and all of these things are things that we're going to be testing. Our team's going to is currently gathering the data for, for to test those ideas um, going forward. So uh, Dave asks the question, and I will answer it uh, right now because I should have answered it before, and I apologize for that. So these data are for um, ever mentors. So the way that these data were gathered is they were the they were scraped from the projects page. So the page that has every project that's ever been in the incubator and their mentors and, and from each individual's project, individual projects page. So it's the union of those two things. And what I believe that means is it represents pro, um, people who were ever mentors of the project. So this isn't restricted to graduation, and it also doesn't have any temporal dynamics within a project. So if a project added a mentor, how did that change it? If they dropped a mentor, how did that change it? So there's lots of ways to slice and dice these data. I'm currently working with a master's student to try to get a better sense of the um, mentorship teams of mentors that have been shown to have an effect on graduation rate. Um, so we could look at these graphs all day long. And if anyone has ideas for a graph they want to see, shoot it over to me and I'll, I'll make it. That's a very quick thing that I can do. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do was uh, look at the if there's an association between having a certain mentor on your project and the probability of that project graduating. So these data, though, are not particularly straightforward to analyze. Uh, and that's because there's a really high chance of graduation. There's an unspecified number of mentors per project. There's no hierarchy in the mentorship team. And there are many mentors who have only been a mentor one time. And this makes it not possible to use a, a standard sort of random effects analysis that we might want to use or we might have been taught in our sort of mid-level grad stats classes. Um, and instead, what we need to use is a method that will allow us to generate sparse solutions. So that will take a lot of possible predictors and reduce that down to a smaller uh, number of possible effects that we're considering. So the, the method that we use for this is called lasso regression. So lasso regression uses a cross-validation technique, leave one out in this case, to determine a budget for the parameter estimates. And then we estimate a model that regularizes the parameter estimates, so changes their magnitude to fit them under the budget. And it uses a soft threshold under which coefficients are set to zero. So what this does is it allows us to take a model that is trying to estimate 304 effects, the number of mentors um, that have ever been in Apache, and reduce it down to just the set of mentors who have been shown to have a relationship with the outcome of interest, in this case, graduation. 
So we then estimate a statistical model, uh, logistic regression in this case, and from that we can talk about the percent of variance in the outcome, so graduation, explained by the coefficients that we've included. So what do we find? Well, when we run this analysis, we find that there are 33, when we run the analysis on all projects, we find that there are 33 mentors that have meaningful impacts on the graduation probability of their projects. 30 of those 33 effects are negative. So this means that those mentors, not that the, not that those mentors made it less likely that a project graduated, but that they reduced the probability of graduation below the population mean. So recall ASF does a great job of graduating projects. Um, so 78% of projects graduate. So in order to have a negative effect, all a mentor has to do is decrease the chance of graduation below that 78% chance. So of those 30 negative effects, 22 of them were from individuals who have only ever mentored one project, which retired. So recall, there are 128 individuals who have mentored one project, and there are over 30 individuals who have mentored only one project, which subsequently retired. So this, this method didn't pick up on all mentors who mentored one project that retired. No, it was, it was more specific than that. Um, but many of these negative effects are mentors who only ever mentored one project, which retired. There are three effects that were positive. Um, here you can see a table that uh, gives the numbered mentors. I'm not going to be saying names on this recording. And the size of their effect relative to the largest effect, which is right here, mentor 27. And then it gives the number of projects that they mentored and the number of projects graduated. So one of the things that's interesting to note is that the mentors who mentored the absolute most projects, so 26, 28, and up around in that number, are not included on this uh, chart. In the in their effects uh, weren't meaningfully different from zero. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't uh, contribute to the graduation rate of projects that they mentor. It means that their contribution is part of what brings it up to this population level 78% graduation rate. So we do have these three positive effects here that we can identify. Mentor 17 has mentored 19 projects and graduated all 19. Uh, mentor 24 has graduated 14 projects and uh, of the 14 that they mentored and mentor two graduated all 12 of the 12 projects that they mentored. Um, so one of the things that we can note from this analysis is the percent of the variance in graduation rate that is explained simply by including who someone had as a mentor on their project. And just by knowing who a mentor was on a project, we're able to account for 45% of the variance in graduation rate. So this means that mentors and the mentorship team actually does have a really big impact on graduation rate. It's just the number of mentors whose behavioral patterns for some reason are associated with increases or decreases in graduation rate is relatively small. And we can restrict this analysis to mentors who have only mentored more than one project. And we see that these same 11 effects here on the right are included. And if we only include those individuals, so we've gotten rid of all mentors who mentored only one project, 
then we're able to explain 25% of the variance in graduation rate. So um, from this analysis, we see that ASF enrolls projects that are quite likely to graduate and does a great job of moving them on towards graduation. But there are some mentors that are associated uh, with a higher graduation probability. And only knowing mentors actually tells us a lot about the possible graduation rate of the projects because only knowing who the mentorship team is organizes 45% of the variation in graduation rate. The uh, individual mentor effects are more often negative than they are positive, but this does not mean that the mentorship program doesn't work because we don't have the counterfactual of these projects having no mentors. Indeed, given everything we know about mentorship in the broader academic literature and everything we know about the requirements to become an Apache top level project, we would expect that having mentors, knowledgeable, experienced mentors is actually really beneficial to projects. So what these findings do show us is that there is a scope to explain why some mentors are more often associated with graduated projects. And that part of that scope may be the behavioral patterns that mentors use, their mentorship strategies that they use when they're interacting with the podlings that they're mentoring. And that ASF and the incubator could learn from those individuals what they do to increase the graduation probability help train mentors as they come to mentor more projects, and all in all, make ASF mentors more effective in moving projects towards graduation. Um, so all academic projects have a bunch of people to thank, um, and especially for this project, NSF, for the money, and then Dave and Justin and uh, Bertrand and all of the officers and participants in ASF who have spoken with me at length, helping me try to understand these data um, better than I could without you. So thank you all and thank you for your time. And that's all that that's all that I had to say about that. So are there any questions? So one of the things as, as people are writing their questions, I know it can take time to write them in case anyone is. Um, so our next step with these data are to actually get a lot better sense of the mentors. So how long they've been involved in ASF, how many projects, what route they came to be part of ASF, um, even things like finding out employment status or, or, or things like that, and then incorporate these different predictors that we think might explain this effect, put them into the model. And then if we're still trying to include everything we can, and we're still finding that there are significant portions of graduation probability organized by mentorship, then that really points to mentorship strategies that are making a difference in moving projects to graduation. Uh, so hopefully, as we continue to go through this process, we will have uh, specific individuals that we will be able to highlight and try to learn from them how they interact with projects and what they do that increases graduation rate. We have one, uh, uh, one mentor here, uh, this, uh, not this one. This mentor number 19 uh, is actually a mentor I was able to speak with uh, pretty extensively. And it's great. Um, <laughs> this person actually identified, self-identified as a retirement specialist in that one of the things they tried to do as a mentor was to try to help projects realize sooner rather than later if they're not going to be able to fit 
into the Apache way. And if they're not going to be able to transition their processes to be in line with Apache policies, then this mentor's opinion was that it would be better for them to get out of the incubator sooner rather than later. We'll save everyone's time and actually make it more likely that the community will persist in the future. So I think that's another important caveat from these findings is that this doesn't say the projects are unsustainable. Projects that retire from the incubator are not necessarily projects that disappear and, and stop being developed or maintained. So that's something in, in further years as we continue our investigation into the health of the open source software commons that we hope to be able to learn as well is how do, how do graduation and retirement from incubators like at ASF connect to long-term sustainability, uh, both within the foundation for graduation graduating projects and in the wild for projects that retire. So um, Justin is, is giving some observations. I don't know if these will um, move with the recording. So I will just file them for um, posterity's sake if anyone watches this video. <laughs> um, so one of the things Justin says is that the high graduation rate is in part due to filtering projects out before they join the ASF. 100%, I agree. Um, so I tried to uh, be very careful in saying that the ASF does a good job of graduating projects that it enrolls into the incubator. And I think there are really two parts to this. One part is that uh, the incubator team is really uh, dedicated to helping projects graduate. I, I've spent hours and hours reading emails, email lists, uh, or chains or threads about projects that have decreased indicators of community health and really experienced people in the incubator uh, talking about, they're not even the mentors for these projects, but they're talking about how they could resurrect this project, kickstart it, get it going again. Uh, there was one really great example. I think it was um, Jean-Baptiste, he, or, uh, JB, um, rather, only his mother calls him Jean Baptiste, I've heard. Um, but uh, JB, there was a project that was really re going towards retirement. And um, JB, JBO, JB Onofre, um, yes, he said, listen, let me, let me talk to the community. Let me see what I can do. And he went in, and it was within, I think it was like three months this three month process, they went from, oh, we probably should retire, no one's taking part anymore, to being ready to graduate, like initiating the pro process to graduate. So people in the incubator really do care about projects graduating and becoming sustainable long-term. But also, as Justin says, the proposal process to get into the incubator is really, it's demanding in a good way in that projects that are likely to succeed will self-select into the proposal process. Um, and so I, I agree that ASF does a really good job of enrolling projects likely to graduate and then also does a really good job of moving enrolled projects to graduation. And then, of course, uh, some projects, however, no matter how stringent the proposal process is, are very unlikely to graduate basically no matter who they have. Um, and that can be a tough position. So it would be nice to try to get a sense of what those projects are and what separates them out uh, and makes them unlikely to graduate uh, no matter who their mentors are. And then also who becomes mentors for projects like that. These are all just, uh, for me, Fascinating questions. So I, I believe that 150 is is my time. Um, so thank you all uh, for looking at 
some of this research that's just starting to come out. And uh, thank you for your participation in interviews and hopefully um, surveys or anything down the line. And please look forward to many years of publications about Apache and the open source software commons and open source software as a public good in the future. So thank you all so much.